Okay, so um, welcome everybody. So um, let me first just uh, flash a few things, uh, a, a bit of, so there is a lot of activity in this field of, for instance, topological uh, uh, floca insulators, as you can see. Uh, I can give references for these things. So um, I will not discuss uh, um, um, uh, complicated things, but I would like to give a hint of how, um, by appropriately uh, driving a, a, a trivial band insulator, you can uh, create a topological floquet bands somehow. Okay? So this is something that I would like to somehow to, to show you today. Uh, let me recap what we, uh, we saw already yesterday. Remember the crucial role played by the evolution operator, hmm, which can be split into a periodic part and, and into a, a phase factor uh, related to the quasi-energy. So in principle, I can write exact solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a periodic system as a product of the quasi-energy, so a phase times a periodic part, uh, un, mm, which is the uh, uh, counterpart of the Bloch theorem for solids. Mm. Uh, and we also saw how, in principle, useful this is to address the long time dynamics of your system, because somehow starting from any initial state, psi zero, you expand it into the Floquet modes of your system, mm, and then the evolution at arbitrary long time essentially is a, uh, like in a quantum quench case, sum of time independent constants times phases times periodic parts. Okay? So very similar to a quantum quench. And we also discussed the fact that somehow uh, I introduced this Floquet Hamiltonian, which is the the object that appears in the exponential uh, somehow giving you those phases. And we discussed that in some sense this is a little bit undetermined because you can always change the quasi-energies with an arbitrary multiple of the uh, driving frequency. And this would absolutely give you the same phases for the evolution operator. So somehow the eigenvalues of this Hermitian Hamiltonian, which is somehow the log of one period uh, evolution operator, are a little bit um, tricky because somehow they are just phases and you can add an arbitrary multiple of 2 pi. Hmm? So you can always, in some, in some sense, restrict your phases between minus pi and pi, which translated means you, you can introduce a Floquet Brillion zone between minus h bar over 2 and plus, h, uh, sorry, h bar omega over 2 plus h bar omega over 2. So you can reduce always your uh, quasi-energies to uh, such interval. But this <coughs> somehow makes uh, uh, things complicated because, I mean, maybe I can, I can start switching now. Well, still, let's insist for a while. Uh, think of uh, ordinary... Uh, strongly correlated system. You have a Hamiltonian, there is a ground state, low-lying excited states, and then you can concentrate on the low-lying part of the spectrum, and a lot of uh, what you do in strong correlation has to do with this. Think of Luttinger liquids, okay? You think of the low-lying excitation of a system. So there is a notion in which you can say that an energy is large because it's highly excited. Now, on a circle, it's hard to actually, actually impossible to order things, okay? There is no higher and lower, because when you fold a, an energy and you bring it into minus pi pi, or minus h bar omega over 2 omega over 2, well, there is no high energy, okay? So somehow, you could find close by on a circle an, an object that somehow originates from a very high energy scale, and it's hard to know uh, what is the truncation that you have to do, okay? So in some sense, this makes life a lot complicated if you are dealing with interactions, for instance, because there is no obvious notion of how to eliminate high energy degrees of freedom, okay? Just to give you a, 
a glance of a possible difficulty. Hmm? Uh, no, sorry. Okay, in fact, I will show you now a, a, simple, a simple case where uh, things can become uh, complicated. But before that, maybe I switch, I switch to the board for a while. Okay? So, <coughs> there are <coughs> two interesting, sim simple, so to speak, limits that you can consider. So, suppose that in your Hamiltonian H of t, uh, the frequency appears in a simple way with some amplitude of omega t, okay? Just to have an idea. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the quasi-energies will depend on those amplitudes A, mm -hmm. okay? And the uh, modes, the Floquet modes, also depend on A. Now, obviously, uh, is an obvious limit when A goes to zero, so the uh, weak driving. Mm -hmm. So the parameters by which you drive go to zero, mm -hmm. which means that somehow your Hamiltonian reduced to a time-independent Hamiltonian, okay? For which, obviously, you know that there is a spectrum, epsilon a ej, and there are eigenstates associated with this, okay? So h equal to ej psi j, okay? Now, clearly, what you expect is that in the limit ea going to zero, this uh, quasi-energy energies and the um, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which somehow means that the evolution operator in that case, so over a period, becomes much uh, simpler. Well, it is just the sum over j of just uh, the energy mm, times the projector of the eigenstates, okay? So this is a, a simple, so to speak, simple. I mean, you still have to uh, make reference to the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian, but somehow you do not have any dynamics to solve. Okay, so this is the limit of infinitesimal weak driving. Now, there is another limit that you can think of, which is the limit, somehow the adiabatic limit, Okay. The adiabatic limit is the limit in which you fix the driving, okay, but you send omega now to zero, okay? So you slow this, uh, slowly drive your system, okay? So suppose that your Hamiltonian depends on uh, time through the modification of some parameters. Let me call R a certain number, vector, of parameters through which your Hamiltonian depends, and it depends on time, okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, if I have a periodic evolution, it means that if I draw somehow this curve in parameter space, okay, the uh, curve will do some close path, because I start from some then I evolve, okay, and then I return at time to the same initial point. Okay? Now, as you uh, understand, this brings, well, for instance, example, the, the uh, uh, spin resonance we, uh, we, we saw yesterday. There, essentially, you have uh, mu b, a magnetic field, times sigma, okay? So the... Uh, for instance, the circularly polarized driving was precisely this thing. So a large magnetic field along Z, which is fixed, and a weaker magnetic field along X and Y that rotates with a certain frequency, omega. Okay. So this is the NMR, um, the NMR um, problem. Now, as you know, <coughs> um, Adiabatic theorem in quantum mechanics requires the presence of a gap. So, suppose that I can solve 
for every value of this R, of this parameter, my spectrum, okay? So what I have is, for instance, the ground state phi zero for a given R, okay? And I also have E zero, the ground state energy for a given R. Hmm? Now, um, and suppose that uh, this ground state, okay, I, drive, I, I draw here a one-dimensional R. Hmm? So this ground state here, as R changes, somehow is separated by a gap which doesn't close from the first excited states and so on and so forth. And in fact, let me assume that all of them are separated so that there are spectral gaps everywhere that separate the eigenvalues of your problem. Okay? So at the end of your evolution, you return to the initial point, but you, in the middle, you do things, but you never close gaps. Okay? Now, you know that um, there is a theorem, which is that if I start from, say, this state here, for instance, and I evolve sufficiently slowly, and the sufficiently slow has to do with the obviously with the gap. Mm? There is a condition uh, depending on the gap for the slowness of the um, uh, evolution. Mm? Let me not uh, write explicit things. They are not particularly important in this. Uh, I will end up uh, again to the same state. So I will stay in this manifold. Okay? Now, it would be, therefore, somehow tempting to say, okay, then uh, my state as a function will be the function of R at time t times a phase, which is the phase that Schrodinger, the Schrodinger equation accumulates, so the integral between zero and t of uh, the ground state energy at RT prime, okay? Now, it turns out that this is wrong, okay? So this is not, this is called the dynamical phase, dynamical phase, and most of you probably have seen there is a correction to this dynamical phase that is called the Berry phase. But let me just spend a few minutes to, um, to, to explain the origin of this, probably known everybody, but uh, let's just quickly see why this must indeed be present, okay? Now, uh, if I um, try to see if such a state solves the Schrodinger equation, at least on average, in the sense that uh, I just require that this object, okay, is zero, okay? So I pretend that I h bar d in the t minus the Hamiltonian apply to such a state when I project back on the state is zero. Then I see immediately that the thing doesn't work for a reason that is simple. Uh, just substitute here e to the minus i h bar the integral, okay, of e zero. And the... Uh, T zero of R of T. Now, when you take the derivative, okay, you can take it in two places. Here, but also on the state. Okay? So if I take the derivative here, you realize immediately that what I get is down exactly a factor, which is plus E zero, the uh, energy at the upper limit, so at t, hmm, uh, times the same state, okay? So times psi of t. Uh, this, by the way, cancels exactly with this guy acting on psi. This will give me E0 of R of t times phi psi of t, okay? So these two terms, in fact, cancel. But unfortunately, there is the other guy, okay, which will give you a term that is um, e to the minus i over h bar integral of 
d in dt of e0 times uh, i h bar the derivative with respect to time of your state. Okay? Now, uh, this implies that if I take now the scalar product with this, this term survives. Okay? In fact, this goes away because when I take the scalar product, there is an, a, a corresponding phase there, but this survives. So the scalar product would give you a term that is uh, you can write as uh, i h bar phi zero of r of t times the derivative with respect to time of phi zero of r of t. Okay? This implies that I have to add something else here in order to make this equation true. And the something else is the Berry phase. So it's something which is e to the i gamma zero of t. And you can show that gamma zero of t is to be exactly the integral of this object. Okay? So you can show that gamma zero of t is i integral from zero to t in d prime of the object that, by the way, I can also write as r dot hmm, times scalar product phi zero of r t prime times the gradient of phi zero. Okay? Now, this object here looks pretty much like the uh, uh, integral along a path, okay? that you do when you do, for instance, you calculate the um, circuitation of uh, a vector potential. And in fact, this, is, uh, this object that appears here is known as Berry, um, Berry connection. Okay? So you can define essentially the uh, object inside here, the I, this object. You can show it's a real thing, which is A0 of of, of R of T, okay? So it's the, a vector field, a real vector field that you have to integrate over the path, and it's important that when you end your path, you have a time T which is equal to T. So this is, in fact, a closed path in parameter space, and therefore the loop integral over a closed loop of this object is, in fact, independent of any possible phase change that you can do to these functions, okay? So it's totally independent of the phase that you have chosen for phi zero. Because if you calculate, in fact, uh, the phi zero on a computer, the computer will give you just the ground state with, in fact, a, I mean, horrible, I mean, just uh, completely random choice in principle of phases in front of your a state. So there is an issue if you do a numerical uh, calculation of this thing or how to actually make sense of this uh, derivatives. You should really calculate finite differences because this would be a catastrophe because the phases are uh, really random. There is a, a prescription to actually calculate um, uh, discrete uh, values of those very phases, but I don't want to enter here. This is just to tell you that uh, uh, Schrodinger dynamics gives, even in the adiabatic limit, a somehow trivial dynamical phase, but also you have to remember that there is a, a Berry phase part. Now, why did I uh, spend this? Because you can immediately understand that you can say something about the evolution operator over one period in this adiabatic limit omega that goes to zero. In fact, uh, in this case, this evolution operator should be of the following form. Sum over all the eigenstates. So you start from a certain eigenstate and end up in the same eigenstate except for a phase factor that you have to write here. So one is the dynamical phase factor. 
integral of the uh, of the energy, mm -hmm. and the second piece is the um, Berry phase, in fact, of, of each state. Okay. Now, obviously, I am assuming that I I can do adiabatic evolution in principle of every eigenstate, which means that not only the ground state has to be protected by a gap, but in principle, I have to have spectral gaps everywhere. So this is a strong assumption, obviously. Okay. So, but in principle, you are saying, okay, suppose that there are gaps everywhere, in the limit of infinitesimally slow driving, I predict that somehow read from here the fact that in principle these are the Floquet modes. So the Floquet modes coincide with the, um, with the uh, eigenstates of your system. But remember that here in principle, so this would be uj uj and here i would need e to the minus i epsilon j tau t over h bar okay this is the expression that in principle i need to um, have for the evolution operator so you realize there is a correction to the quasi energy uh, due to the berry phase okay so if you write explicitly that epsilon j t should be equal to the integral of the energies, okay, the instantaneous energies, but there is also a third that is the Berry phase, okay? So if I extract what the quasi-energy is, I discover that is the average over instantaneous energy, but there is a correction which is t, or if you want, h bar omega over 2 pi times the Berry phase, okay? So remember that you have to account for this very important Berry phase factor in the adiabatic limit. You might say, but, but omega is small. Yes, but remember that I can always put my epsilon j into the interval minus h bar omega over 2, h bar omega over 2. So, I mean, this is exactly of the right order. So you shouldn't really throw it away. And in fact, and in fact this is crucial to describe tauless pumping in an insulator. Okay? You can show that the quasi-energy, as you do a pump, a, a, a periodic thing, they in fact wind, they somehow do a winding in a quasi-energy space, and this winding is related to the um, Berry phase because the object would actually return to the original point, okay? So if you throw away this term and you keep only the average of the dynamical thing, you would completely miss the uh, topological aspect of this winding of quasi-energies, okay? This is just uh, to glimpse uh, of the thing, okay? So let's, uh, <clears throat> let's just, uh, uh, before uh, switching to the uh, Haldane and to the uh, Chern insulator, uh, let me just uh, show one second uh, possible uh, things. Can, can we switch to the... To the um, to the uh, okay. Now let's take a very very simple problem: a particle in a box. What could be simpler than this? Okay. Now you know perfectly well uh, what are sorry what are the um, sorry, the, 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 what are those objects? Where did I write them? Here, the EJ, the values of the undriven system, okay? They are just uh, growing with n square. Hmm? Uh, forget about their written part. It's confusing so far. Now, uh, add a, an electric field that oscillates with a certain frequency omega. That's 
essentially what you do if you want to, uh, with a laser, to provoke a transition from, say, the ground state, uh, which is even, to the first excited states, which is, which is odd, okay, in the, in the well, and uh, here there is an X, in fact. Okay, so this is a scalar potential gauge for the electric field that oscillates, and suppose that the omega is chosen so that you closely match, but not perfectly, the separation between the ground state and the first excited states, okay? So I don't know if uh, so the spectrum, the spectrum is, is this. This is the E1. Let's call it, say, 1. Then there is a factor 4 for E2, a factor 9, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the fully discrete spectrum of my particle in the box. And then I just have an omega close to resonance to this. Hmm? Let's see what happens to the Floquet spectrum as a function, so I will draw the Floquet spectrum as a function of the amplitude of the driving. So this F0 is called here, not A. Okay? So let's see. Um, okay, so this is the Floquet spectrum. You see, it's folded back in the interval between minus 0.4 and 0.6, so 1 h bar omega, no, not really symmetric, but doesn't matter. Now, those two arrows are this state here and this other state that would actually be above that, but I have reported back, folded back in the first billion zone by subtracting a certain number of h bar omega, okay? So they come close, in fact. And as I turn on the driving, Okay? They do separate. They do kind of resonate a lot. But if I insist, uh, the spectrum becomes quite complex. There are lots of avoided crossing here and there. And in fact, these are only the big ones that you see. But if you zoom in, uh, lots of other things occurring. And that's not all. You see there are only 20 levels. Because I decided, for plotting reasons, it's not me, by the way, it's whole house, but never mind. Uh, I decided for plotting reasons that I truncate, not only for plotting reasons, for calculational reasons. Suppose that I ask you, calculate the Floquet one period evolution operator for this system. It's an infinitely dimensional thing, although it's a single particle in a box. So you don't deal with infinite matrices, and you decide to truncate the Hilbert space to a certain number, okay? Here, the truncation is up to 60, and the, uh, sh the plot is with when 20 levels. But if I had to include all the levels, this would be a very, very, very dense set of levels that would show all kind of crazy quasi-resonances. We discussed yesterday those things and, and avoided crossing. It's a real mess, a real mess. And in fact, Obviously, mathematicians like those things. And uh, this is, for instance, a paper by Holland uh, uh, considering exactly problems like this. So single particle problems with sufficiently uh, box-like confining potentials where uh, it proves that uh, um, uh, the uh, eigenvalues have no absolutely continuous spectrum. So there are spectral issues related to this things that uh, mathematicians would, uh, I mean, just uh, uh, clarify uh, if you can read what they, what they say. It's, I mean, I often go hard beyond the title, name, and abstract, okay? But, uh, I mean, in principle, they, they do things. Even more uh, complicated, suppose that your system is not a particle in a box, but is an hydrogen atom, okay? Now, the hydrogen has a discrete part of the spectrum, okay? Say here. And in fact, there is an infinite number of states, and then there is a continuum, okay? Now, remember the uh, discussion we had yesterday about the Vanier Stark um, uh, ladder of, of, of states. So if this is the zero, remember that I, I can repeat the same spectrum 
in, say, this was m equal 0, this was the Fourier m equal 1, m equal minus 1, and so on and so forth. So I would repeat this by shifting all levels by h bar omega. Remember the, 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 this um, uh, slope, this effective electric field, which means that, for instance, here I have this here I have the continuum, for instance, that starts here, okay? So immediately you see that, for instance, those levels do have a coupling to the continuum, okay? So I can photoironize an excited level with a one photon uh, matrix element. Hmm? But even the ground state, sooner or later, okay, will have an overlap with the continuum, okay? So for instance, with a two photon or three photon process, in principle, given sufficiently long time, okay, to build for the appropriate probability of escaping, the system would escape. Okay, so I have transformed the discrete, for instance, stable ground state of my hydrogen atom into actually a metastable state. And this is the subject of communication of mathematical physics of the end of the 80s. Again, I can hardly go beyond the title here, okay? So, but, I mean, he shows that essentially the whole spectrum of the hydrogen atom becomes full of resonances. There are no longer uh, discrete states that you can think of. So, just, just to give you some warning about uh, delicacies and things that have to do with continuum limit, uh, high energy, absence of ordering, uh, okay. Hmm. Oh, well, you can do, you can do uh, lowest order perturbation theory to couples, for instance, those, those splitting of two levels, certainly. But uh, uh, those features here, they are, you see, they are strong coupling fields, uh, and uh, they are cup, they are. N photon processes, so you would need to do N order perturbation theory to capture those little features. So in principle, you have to be equipped with a sufficiently precise high order perturbation theory to, uh, to, to grasp those features, okay? Because for instance, like uh, the Iraq rule, like experiment golden rule, emerged as perturbation theory, effective time and energy of the benefit theory. So in fact, there should be a link between the very They should, they should. But uh, I mean, honestly, it's a, I mean, it can, can be a nightmare to look at spectra that emerge from an actual problem. And uh, yeah. Because you are tempted, you are tempted to say that uh, because because the spectrum after a while is so complicated that it is for this to take out an electron. Well, the, the, there there are there are reason there are resonances that uh, you should in principle expect. Now, the fact that this leads to photoionization is a is a different story. You cannot take electrons out of an infinite box, for instance. Okay, okay. so <laughs> but in the hydrogen atom. I do believe that, uh, no, you, you are right, I mean, it, that problem has a triangular barrier because of the, uh, the ionization, I think, that uh, induces a, a, a linear potential and you have to, but uh, in this uh, um, hydrogen case, I think that people have uh, discussed that, I mean, if you do sufficiently high fields, okay, maybe this is the, the thing, uh, there, there should be photoionization with uh, sufficiently high order. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> complication of mathematical. <laughs> no, I mean uh, it's a, it's a it's a hard thing, uh, and uh, possibly very subtle. But uh, uh, ask uh, Yashima for that. I take no responsibility. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now let me switch a little bit. No, I, I, I agree with you. There are there are pu puzzling things. Uh, uh, that's the reason why I. Tend to uh, tend to stay away from. Uh, 
No, I don't want. I absolutely don't want to do that. I I sent I sent Yajima and his uh, his thing against the farm. I I stay behind the lines. Okay. <laughs> no, but there, there are. I mean, at least in models, in models, there are subtle uh, questions about uh, uh, spectral problems. Okay. I mean, the thermodynamic limit for the spectral theorem in an, in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space is a, I mean, you have to say, is this pure point spectrum, uh, absolutely continuous spectrum? I mean, there are all these features, I mean, essentially under some localization, you have lots of uh, spectral uh, eigenvalues, but they are associated to localized wave functions, so you call them pure point. Uh, I mean, to me, it looks continuous, but it's not continuous because the functions are not extended. So there are lots of small, small details like this, and again, I would send them uh, with, uh, I stay behind the line. Okay, so you know that there is this uh, very, um, uh, are we looking at, uh, yeah, uh, very uh, remarkable effect emerged in the 80s, that is the quantum wall effect, and in fact, um, just last year, uh, Haldane with Taules uh, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for essentially having written down, in, just in the 80s, a model on the, a tight binding model on the hexagonal lattice, which somehow shows uh, a quantum hole effect without actually having a uniform magnetic field as here, so without actually breaking translational invariance, because one of the nightmares when you put a magnetic field on a lattice is that you immediately break translational invariance, okay? Although the field might be uniform, the vector potential is not. And because of that, this makes uh, enters in conflict with the underlying crystal potential, okay? So it can make life extremely complicated, although if you decide to use um, rational um, fluxes over plaquettes, you can still make sense of uh, an enlarged Brillouin zone, and you can write uh, Harper Hofstadter type of models, and you know the uh, Hofstadter butterfly, the spectrum can be somehow studied, it's a, but it's a complicated thing. Haldane wrote a model, which is a quite uh, somehow simple model, so let me just uh, <clears throat> explain what it is. So if I have uh, a graphene, hmm? graphene is essentially a tight binding uh, problem, okay? So you can hope on nearest neighbor on a uh, honeycomb lattice uh, with a synthetic element minus T1, okay? Now the honeycomb lattice as a particular structure is bipartite. See, I have colored those uh, things black and white, so there is a A sublattice and the B sublattice, okay? And the, this hopping connects A with B, okay? But not A with A. So A with A would be a second neighbor hopping, okay? If you do this, obviously you, this is the direct lattice. This is a standard exercise in, say, uh, solid state Ashcroft and Mermin type of thing. Okay, this is the Brillouin zone. The Brillouin zone is hexagonal. And you have the corners of that hexagon that will play a, an important role in the following. And uh, you can actually use translational invariance on the, in this lattice and reduce your Hamiltonian in momentum space, okay, because this is a translational invariant problem, to a, a, a sum over k, k vectors in the Brillouin zone, a two by two problem, like a spin, okay? Now, spin is, uh, in fact, not included in the description because it's largely irrelevant to what I'm going to say. It's essentially, uh, two, the two sublattices play the role of the two species in this pseudo spin one half, okay? Sublattice A and sublattice B. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do your uh, exercise, the hopping T1, since it couples A with B, will result in an off-diagonal term in this two-by-two two matrix, okay? Now, you can calculate what are those Rx and Ry. Notice it's like a sigma X plus 
my water, okay? So somehow you, are an, you have an effective, let me call it, magnetic field in the XY plane, nothing on Z, hmm? okay? Because of that, <clears throat> it so happens, because of symmetries, obviously, that if I go to the border of the Brillouin zone, Okay, I could write Rx and Ry, but never mind, really, because it's, I mean, just cosine and sine. The miracle is that if you go to the border of the zone, these are two points that are at the corner of the brilliant zone hexagon, you find two cones. These are called the Dirac cones, okay? Now, um, uh, how can you actually make this an insulator? Well, it's a very simple thing. Uh, those Dirac cones are somehow protected by symmetries. For instance, the two sublattices were exactly the same energy. If you in, make the two on-site energy even slightly different, so for instance, instead of considering atoms absolutely equivalent, like carbon, you consider them to be two species, like boron and nitrite. They are similar to carbon, but they are slightly different. So same valence. Hmm? Then the uh, uh, energy of sublattice A and the energy of sublattice B would be slightly changed. This would add uh, a term, for instance, sublattice would be shifted up and sublattice B would be shifted down. Okay? As a result of that, you see this is like now a term in the sigma z direction. Okay? You are putting a magnetic field in the z direction. So the miracle ends at those points where the magnetic field was magically zero, now is not zero because of this, and therefore there is a small gap which is proportional to this quantity here. Okay? This is a trivial insulator because you break uh, inversion symmetry between the two lattices, a kind of parity thing. Now, what uh, Haldane, so this is, what Haldane thought is, well, Let's include a second neighbor hopping, okay? Second neighbor means that A hops into A, okay, but a second neighbor distance, and B also into B, okay? So all second neighbors see each other with a hopping matrix element that is complex, however, and this is especially designed. How did they figure out this, this type of thing? I mean, the total flux that this thing has on the exact, you know, thing is actually zero. So the, the net magnetic field that you have to um, in, invent somehow, this is like the field of monopoles put at the center of the hexagon. If you calculate what is the total fl flux on each thing by just uh, the fact that the magnetic field is at zero divergence, is just zero. So the, for instance, those hoppings are completely insensitive because of a simple argument to this magnetic field, but the second neighbors not, okay? So he figured out that maybe one could break now time reversal because I'm now making hoppings complex and therefore I'm really breaking time reversal. And with this uh, T2 e to the i phi, notice the arrows here, okay? So for sublattice say uh, B, uh, the flux uh, follows the arrows in that way for sublattice A, it, it follows in that way, okay? This makes the model incredibly rich. All you need to do is to add one piece of information here. So what is now this RZ depending on K, which is not longer a constant delta minus delta, is in fact a simple function. Let me just write it, just for the... Where is it? Here. So the Dane model brings RZ being the delta AB, which by, by the way he calls M because like a mass in a Dirac problem, okay? Then I have, uh, where is it? Here, plus two T2, the sine, of phi, phi is the flux that you put, times 
the sum over j from of uh, the sum of k dot aj. aj are the second neighbor, um, the second neighbor lattice vectors that in fact generate the, um, the maybe it's written here, okay? So a1, a2, and a3 are those three vectors, okay? You do this, and you essentially have solved by, I mean, full translational invariance, so solving two by two problems. You have in break, broken time reversal, and he found a surprising things. There is a phase diagram for this thing. If you plot uh, the, the, this mass, so here you put or, or M, okay, delta B, T2, okay? And here you put the flux, phi, hmm? so this is no flux, this is pi, this is my. There is a curve that you can draw here, okay? Which is essentially a sign, okay? Ends here at three root three, okay? So if you are outside of this, um, of this two regions, hmm? so here for instance, or for instance, zero phase here, this is a trivial insulator we discussed before. Just delta, no, no fit. Okay? But if you still have an insulator, but it's a strange insulator. Now, the thing that I would like to, uh, probably many of you have seen this, but uh, let me just spend one min minute for those of you who have not seen it. Now, this vector function R of k, remember Rx, Ry, and Rz, k runs over the Brillouin zone, which as you know is a torus because you can identify opposite sides of the things. It's a surface, this object uh, draws a surface, because the Brillouin zone is two-dimensional, in the three-dimensional space of this R, okay? Now, the R is a modulus and there's a direction for every value of k. The modulus tells you the bands because as you know, if I have a certain magnetic field, okay, dotted into sigma and I ask you, tell me what are the eigenvalues of these things? Well, E plus or minus k are just equal to plus or minus the modulus of R of k, okay? So, if I have the, this information, I can draw bands, okay, with this. And here are the bands. These are the bands of the trivial insulator face, the point up there, okay? These are the bands of this insulator there inside the shaded region. I anticipate it's a topological insulator. Can you see a difference? Obviously not. They are almost the same, okay? So you look at the bands, and you lose information on something, something which has to do with wave functions, because the modulus of R really tells you the energy, but the direction tells you how the spinners of this spin one half actually uh, do in the block sphere as you move the K in the Brillouin zone, okay? So the whole issue is, what do these spinners do? Hmm? Uh, by the way, if you uh, sit exactly on top of uh, uh, one of those two lines, hmm, then you see that one of the two Dirac points, in fact, closes, the other not, okay? So the graph, the graph uh, fight things, uh, the graphing things, which is the point in the middle, is special in which you have both the Dirac points closed. Uh, on those things, only one of the two, either this or that, is closed. So these are somehow critical uh, points separating the trivial insulator from the uh, topological insulator uh, point, okay? Now, let me just show the information that you have for this angle that R of K draws. Uh, where is it? Oops, sorry. Okay, if I am up there and I try to see what the 
unit vector of R of k does, as you span k on the Brillouin zone, this is the surface. This is the origin zero magnetic field, so that R equals zero. Zero means the degeneracy of these eigenvalues, okay? So this is the point, in fact, if you know about the Berry phase of a spin one half, is a magnetic monopole that somehow uh, stands exactly in the origin of this uh, three-dimensional point uh, here, okay? So this surface actually is a closed surface which, however, avoids um, the, uh, so it doesn't wrap around the uh, origin of this thing. On the contrary, if you are here, the R of K wrap arounds the origin, okay? So the crucial uh, um, physical, thing, you might say, okay, well, who cares? I mean, is this physics? Yes, it is, because you can show, and this was shown by Taules in a famous PRL paper in 1981, TK and N, Taules, Komoto, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, Denise and I forgot the <laughs> Nightingale. Okay. So you can show that uh, uh, you can write the whole conductance of a system like this hmm, as an integral over the Brillouin zone, assuming that you can just do things with the appropriate translation. So they, they worked essentially in Harper of Stutter type of. Uh, situations, okay, you can write as a nice uh, anti-symmetric integral of this. Order. These are the periodic part of the block wave functions. And these are derivative with respect to kx and ky. By the way, you remember that in the, in the Berry uh, connection exercise we did, there were derivatives with respect to parameters, okay? So this is, in fact, the magnetic field associated to that Berry connection, okay? So it's like uh, the integral of a magnetic field. Now, just to make uh, things short, um, you can actually show that if you take this problem, okay, and you calculate for your two by two Haldane problem, all you have to calculate is the following integral of that surface R of K, where you recognize one over R square is the field of the monopole, dotted into this object, which is the surface element uh, of the, uh, spanned by that surface. Never mind if you don't follow the algebra. That's not uh, the, the crucial thing here. The point is that somehow this object is zero if I am in a trivial insulator phase. And is different from zero, for instance, plus one or minus one, if I am inside here, which means that there is physics in here, here there is a null conductance, so you put an electric field in the x direction, and the current flows in the y direction, okay? And here, in the opposite, okay? So, uh, uh, well, just to show you those surfaces, what they do. Here, the surface is completely outside of the monopole, and here is and closing the monopole, okay? So if you calculate by Gauss law, what is the flux of the monopole through the surface, here you would say zero, and here, obviously, one, with the appropriate normalization for pi's and things, okay? So it's a, essentially a Gauss law exercise to calculate that um, Berry integral that Taules discovered, okay? Good. So this is Haldane. Uh, well, obviously, there are edge states, but I don't want to... How, maybe, maybe we should stop, right? Should, okay. Good time for a break. Good time for a break. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks.
Okay, so let's uh, uh, just just to finish the discussion about the Haldane model. I just I showed to you uh, things done with full translational invariance, so solving two by two problems for every k, hmm? uh, which is very uh, handy. Um, but somehow uh, you discover something also useful if you uh, uh, work on a strip, for instance. So suppose that I take a, p a strip of graphene. Uh, uh, where in the X I cut things, okay? And in the Y, I just close it. So I, like a, a, a little piece of a cylinder, okay? So obviously I have broken translational invariance in the X direction. I have N X uh, somehow sides, cells in this direction, and I will find N X bends as a function of the K Y momentum. The momentum along Y can still be used but along x, I will find nx bends, okay? So let's see what these bends look. Um, here is the trivial insulator kind of things. You see that these are the um, bends uh, in periodic boundary conditions, so the, the bends I showed before. These are the bends that you would find for the strip, okay? You see those lines are the nx bends that accumulate and somehow make uh, uh, picture quite similar to that. There is a, there is a gap separating these uh, two states. The, the raccoon is open, okay? Now I go forward and I stay here on the critical line of the Haldane model. You see that there is uh, one of the two cones that closes and in fact on the strip you see that the things touches. No surprise after all. The surprise comes here. You I'm inside the topologically uh, non-trivial uh, thing, the bulk bends reopen, okay? And they seem to be very similar, superficially similar to those, but there are states inside the gap that cross between the, these two bulk bends, okay? These are called edge states. So somehow the topologically non-trivial phase okay, is associated with the transverse uh, whole current and also with edge states that you would see if you open up uh, the um, boundary condition in one of the directions, okay? Um, okay, now, what people uh, did to try to realize this uh, model on the, uh, in the lab, uh, it's very hard to imagine putting uh, magnetic fields has Haldane had in mind with actual magnetic field and charged particles. Zero flux on each plaquette. Um, it's, a, it's a very messy thing. So people try to emulate uh, these complex phases in the hopping through uh, ultra cold fermions hopping on a lattice. Okay? And now you start thinking I mean, these are neutral objects. So I need to have something which somehow gives a complex hopping amplitude, okay? If I don't do anything, there will be some real no time translation, no um, time reversal invariance, some real hopping matrix element, and nothing really surprising happens. Uh, how do I do it? You do it by shaking, okay? So let me just uh, um, show what they do. So they create a lattice, optical lattice, by standing waves in the kind of standard way by now, okay? So you want a certain lattice, you have a standing wave in the X, in the Y, and you create positions where your atoms sit comfortably, okay? That's the lattice. If you, uh, obviously the standing wave is created by, by laser and mirrors, okay? Now, you can move the mirrors with piezos, okay, which change the standing wave, okay? This is a bit like, suppose that you are, <clears throat> okay, Let's say you are an atom in the standing wave thing. It's like you are on a bus, okay? The light is moving because of the mirror thing. So you are on a bus accelerating, okay? So in the reference frame, okay, which is moving with the uh, lattice, 
you feel a non-inertial force. You feel a force along the x direction, which is equal to minus to the object. Okay? This is a the fictitious force that you see in the moving frame. Well, obviously you can do it along the y as well, and you would feel a fictitious force in the y direction. And obviously you can do it in a concerted fashion. Okay? So they move, you see these two things. Now, obviously you feel a force that is equal to minus m, now a vector uh, acceleration of this um, uh, box somehow. Okay? Now, if obviously these things are uh, linearly related, you actually move in a certain diagonal. But if you do something like uh, the cosine of omega, let me call it omega, t, plus, so in the x direction, plus the sine of omega t, you are creating a circularly polarized shaking, okay? So it's like a bus that does like this rather than just doing it like this. Now, this is interesting. So you feel a force, and this force kind of wants to, you to move around. You start suspecting that maybe currents are generating, and in fact, this is what happens, okay? So let me show you how these artificial gauge fields <laughs> that somehow I wanted, remember, I want complex faces in hopping to get the Haldane model. Here I told you that I have a force. Okay, so what? What do I do with a force? Well, <clears throat> well, perhaps to anticipate, you know that I can represent an electric field with a scalar potential, hmm, where I would see something like this. So a uniform force is like a uniform electric field. I can represent it with a scalar potential. I can also represent it by changing gauge with a vector potential, okay? So the exercise that I'm going to do now for you is to now demystify a little bit the artificial gauge fields. Where do they emerge? You can do a, a simple calculation to see where they emerge, okay? Let's do it. <clears throat> so I have my lattice, okay? So the, this, whatever, standing wave pattern, okay, which the atom feel. Hmm? And I do this uh, uh, shaking uh, with a circular polarization, the mirrors. And therefore, <clears throat> what I feel is a potential at every point, okay, on my lattice. And this potential is time dependent, obviously, and is equal to minus the force, okay, fictitious force dotted the position Ri, right? So if I have to write for you a Hamiltonian, let's use tight binding, okay? So the Hamiltonian would be the just nearest neighbor hopping. So this would be, say, sum over uh, J prime J, okay, of H J prime J, C dagger J prime Cj, okay? Nearest neighbor hopping. But there is an extra term, which is due to this uh, scalar potential on the side. Mm? And the extra term uh, is essentially sum over the sides of minus the subject here. F of t dotted into Rj, C dagger J, Cj. Okay. Let me call this thing Hv, induced by the scalar potential, is the time-dependent term. Okay? Now, I would like to change now <clears throat> age. And you remember, <clears throat> we did it even in the first lecture, that if I move from a moving frame to a lab frame, I do have a gauge transformation that I have to make. Okay? So let me suggest, okay, and remember, so if I have the states psi of t, and I do a unitary transformation that depends on, on time, the transformed state psi tilde of t obey a Schrodinger equation with the transformed Hamiltonian psi tilde of t, which is, we did it several times already, u dagger h 
u, right? But there is an extra term, minus i h bar, the u dagger times u dot. Okay? You should never forget this. Okay, now I want to eliminate a scalar potential. Let me try such an object, u of t equal to e to the minus i over h bar, the integral of this um, hv Hamiltonian, so sum over j, vj of t times c dagger j, cj, okay? So on each side, I give an extra phase to the orbital, okay? Um, and I do this integral. Now, it is a rather simple uh, calculation to, uh, first of all, to show that if I do transform a, a seed operator, what I get is indeed a phase, e to the i over h bar, the integral in the t prime of v of t prime, vj of t prime, times the same operator, okay? So the operators acquire a phase. Interesting, but the nice thing is that if you calculate what is this object, it's a one-line calculation essentially, taking derivatives and doing a very simple algebra, you discover this is exactly minus the scalar potential Hamiltonian that I wanted to eliminate, okay? Fantastic. Then let's proceed with this calculation. Here I have u t dagger h0, the hopping Hamiltonian, u t. And here I have plus u t dagger, the scalar potential part, u t, okay, minus h v, okay, which comes from this extra term. Obviously, since this object changes the phase of uh, the orbitals, and since hv contains, remember, where is it? Here, sum over j, vj, c dagger j, cj, the phase that you put here and the phase that you put there just eliminate completely, and therefore, these two terms are actually the same. So I have eliminated the scalar potential. Hmm? Okay, it's a simple thing. And, and what? Well, that's a tight binding decorated by those two phases, two, two unitary operators that give you phase to the thing. Okay, let's write it explicitly. So this object becomes, so the transformed Hamiltonian becomes sum over j prime j, h j, j e to the, I need some space, it the integral in d t prime of v j t prime minus uh, v j uh, prime. I think I, I think I have here v j prime. No, never mind. I mean, you can figure out the who is j and who is j prime times c dagger j prime c j. Okay. So since in the hopping, the two orbitals are uh, different, you generate a phase, okay? That doesn't cancel any longer. And this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted the phase appearing in the thing. Notice, if I have a nearest neighbor coupling, the phase appears in the nearest neighbor coupling. I do not generate officially, at least so far, second neighbors, okay? I have just made complex the nearest neighbor hoppings, okay? By the way, this is the force that appears here, so the acceleration, and of course, if you integrate, you get the velocity. So this object is e to the i m over h bar, the velocity of the lattice, so the shaking velocity of the lattice, cross the product with rj prime minus rj, okay? So effectively, this is, by the way, the simplest probably way of appreciating why you get the Peyer substitution when you do tight binding. Mm? 
you know that to add a vector potential in a tight binding problem, you do not do P plus A square, because this would break um, gauge invariance. You do it by the so-called Peyer substitution, which is adding faces in the hopping terms. Well, this is exactly a kind of Peyer substitution derived in, I mean, to, to, um, in this simple setting. Okay? So the velocity will shake provides an, effectively, an effective vector potential to your problem. E does not appear. Things are neutral, have a mass, you shake them, you can make interesting uh, gauge fields, okay? Circularly polarized gauge field. So let, let me just switch again to the, to the um, no, maybe I would just, uh, I would go to the full, full blackboard, full um, PC. Okay, so this is what they do in the experiment. They shake, okay, and they induce uh, time-dependent phases on the nearest neighbors, okay? And they do it in such a way that these phases here are secretly polarized. So somehow phi1, phi2, and phi3, they come one after the other in the way you expect. So if this is phi1, for instance, phi2 and phi3 are shifted by 2 pi over 3, okay, or pi over 3, all right? Now, obviously, they ramp up this shaking. They do not start immediately. They ramp up the shaking like this, okay, until, until they settle it with a certain frequency, okay? Uh, so after loading the atoms into the honeycomb lattice, we ramp up a sinusoidal modulation of the lattice position, along the x and y direction with certain final amplitudes. Interestingly, the frequency, so this is the frequency, the omega of the driving, four kilohertz, small, but remember these are optical lattices, so things are small in that world, okay? You have to do it very low temperature, okay? And phase different phi. So phi is the circular polarization uh, thing, for instance, 90 degrees, okay? Uh, the interesting thing is that they say uh, somewhere, where, what is the unperturbed band of those atoms? After all, these are honeycomb lattice things. They have an associated, they have bands. They have an band, okay, small. In fact, it's 3.9 kilohertz. So the frequency is just above the bandwidth. Now, if you remember, the Vanier uh, lattice construction, uh, I better try to have drivings that are sufficiently fast in order to avoid resonances. Remember? So suppose that here I have some levels, a certain bandwidth W, okay? This is a discrete setting. So there are obviously higher bands, which I neglect. Okay? The, the true continuum of things would imply something up here, other bands. I just disregard them. Okay? And then I put the usual uh, h bar omega uh, electric field thing. And the field is such that it is larger than this. It means that the different things do not touch each other, do, do not resonate with each other. Okay? So you have to have a sufficiently large frequency that you do not evoke resonances between this, those things. Otherwise, things become messy. Hmm? Now, you might say, okay, let's take omega very, very, very large so that this is not a problem. Yes, do it. But at a certain point, you are really uh, touching bands that you have not included. So you, watch out, because one thing is the ideal tight binding model that you wrote, and one thing is reality. Reality means that there are higher bands. So if you actually have omega very, very large, chances are that you kind of invoke bands that you would like to throw away from your description. Is it clear? Okay. So some, you have to set omega larger than W, okay, but not too large to avoid invoking higher bands. Okay. 
So that's what they do to actually, um, uh, oh yes, ah, here they say the bandwidth is 3.9 and the frequency is 4. Okay, so it's marginally larger than that. Okay, so the rest is in fact uh, what I told you before, and you might say, okay, I have a modulated tight binding problem with nearest neighbor hoppings. Now, uh, what do I actually do with it? Why is this topological in any way? This is a driven problem with complex phases. And the trick is the following. Remember, I do have a Floquet problem here behind, obviously, okay? It's a complicated time order exponential of this time-dependent Hamiltonian. I told you, you can always rewrite this period, full period uh, evolution operator as e to the minus a Floquet Hamiltonian times t, okay? Which somehow makes this complex t exponential into a simple looking so-called Hermitian package. Hmm? Now, uh, generally speaking, this is a very, very complicated Hamiltonian. We, we said this perhaps not even well defined in certain cases, uh, but certainly if omega is sufficiently large, uh, so here I am in the regime, if you remember the first lecture where I had my omega axis, I am here sufficiently fast driving. Well, fast but not too fast to invoke other bands, but never mind. Certainly not fast so that if omega is large, the period, which is 2 pi over omega, is small. If the period is small, I can try to expand things to second order. Okay? So, the idea is essentially the following. I do have a, a time order exponential, which I can expand on one side. Okay. So let's, let's just quickly do it. At least hint to what you do. This is a t order exponential of uh, minus i over h bar, the integral of the Hamiltonian, okay? So let me expand to second order in this small time t. By the way, what I'm going to tell you is called Magnus expansion. So it's appropriate for large enough, okay? Never dare to actually push it too far where you find resonances because it would tell you Strange things. Okay. So I expand this. I have 1 minus i over h bar, the integral of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So this is somehow the average Hamiltonian. Okay. In fact, if I divide by t and I multiply by t, you see this is precisely the zero component Fourier transform we discussed um, yesterday. Okay. And then I have a second order term. You have to be a little bit more careful because time order dictates <clears throat> dictates that you do things right. Here I have plus minus i over h bar square. I do the integral up to t in the first time t1. There will be a 1 over 2 factorial in the time ordering. I renounce to this and I stop the second integral to t1, okay? So this is, you can show it's precisely equivalent to doing the time ordering, okay? So t2 is always less than t1 because I stopped there and there is no one over two factorial, okay? So this is the truncation to second order of the t order exponential, okay? And I know that this in some sense should be equal to e to the minus i the Floquet Hamiltonian times t over h bar, okay? Let me just expand this. I have 1 minus i over h bar, the Floquet Hamiltonian times t, and I have a second order piece, minus i over h bar uh, square, 1 over 2 factorial, uh, Floquet Hamiltonian square, and so on and so forth, t square, okay? 
then I match this, those two things. Okay? I just try to calculate what is the Ham Floquet Hamiltonian that matches this thing. And I discovered the following thing. The Floquet Hamiltonian is equal to the average Hamiltonian, okay? Zero component Fourier transform, plus one over h bar omega times the commutator of the plus one Fourier component, so the integral with e to the i omega t, commutator with the minus one Fourier component, plus other two terms that are not particularly important, plus, obviously, order of 1 over omega square, and so on and so forth, okay? So I'm truncating this, uh, I think that I have, yes, I have it right, okay? Now, what is H0? Well, remember, my Hamiltonian faces uh, on nearest neighbor, okay? So they appear as uh, some... Uh, t times e to the uh, minus i phi 1 of t, okay? And this object is some amplitude times some sine of omega t, okay? So immediately you realize that what I have to know is how to calculate integrals of the exponential of a sine. But you know that this typically involves the Jacobi identity. So if I have e to the i a, the sine of, say, omega t minus some object theta, you know that this is the sum over n from minus infinity to plus infinity of Bessel functions of A times e to the i n omega t minus theta. Okay? So if I want the average Hamiltonian, I have to take the term with n equals zero, and therefore, what I get is essentially a nearest neighbor hopping with a slightly renormalized T1, that is T1 times the Bessel function of the amplitude, okay? So to zero order, uh, this Floquet Hamiltonian is essentially nearest neighbor with a slightly changed hopping, okay? The J0 reduces a little bit the hopping. But then there is this term. This is h1 and h minus 1, okay? So I have to calculate the extra term and the commutator. Now, when you do the commutator of things that hop to first neighbor, you will find that terms that hop to second neighbor emerge, okay? So all of the sudden, a second neighbor terms emerge by just doing this commutator. And the miracle is that is exactly of the form of the Haldane model. So a T2 emerges that you can calculate, which is equal to, it's written here. Well, sorry. So minus square root of 3, T1 square, the Bessel function of order 1 square, the amplitude of your driving, divided by h bar omega, the frequency of your driving. And the flux of the hamilton is precisely in the middle of those lobs. So, for instance, pi over 2. Remember the shaded regions? Uh, I erased them. This one. Okay. So the flux is exactly here in the middle. And you have a certain T2. Okay? So by cranking up sufficiently A, if A is too small, T2 is small and you, you end up here. But if you crank up A sufficiently, you are able, remember this is delta AB over T2, so you must have a sufficiently large T2 to enter this region, and you can do it. Okay? So that's what they did to actually create the Haldane model by shaking and uh, sufficiently fast, so above the, uh, the, the bandwidth, not too fast to avoid heating and all kind of uh, nasty things, okay? So this is essentially 
uh, the artificial gauge field that you can create by just uh, uh, moving mirrors in optical lattices with neutral atoms, okay? Obviously, people who do op optics, they have lots of other tricks with uh, Raman transition to create um, artificial gauge fields. But this is one of the probably sim simplest to understand, okay? I think that, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, if we were to expand duty in Floquet mode with the eigenenergies in front, like this, and find eigenenergies, like without finding the H, uh, maybe a time separate, would you find that what kind of eigenenergies uh, uh, would you find then? So let's say we start from the fourth, we start uh, on the upper board, um, and analyze into Floquet modes. Yeah. What sort of Oh, here. Okay. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to quit now because of, uh, I mean, it's, we are close to lunch. But since you ask, I, I show it to you. So the message of the story is that the Floquet Hamiltonian is up to order 1 over omega squared, the Haldane Hamiltonian. Okay? This is the first thing. So I have created the Haldane Hamiltonian by shaking. But now, let's see. What you, what, you, uh, what you do if you actually do the driving, okay? So here, I'm not using the Magnus expansion, no. I'm just taking my tight by me model on uh, the hexagonal lattice, and I have a time-dependent thing. I put them on a computer. These are one-particle problems. Luckily enough, I can still do it, okay? So this is, in fact, what you, you were asking this is the Floquet quasi-energies. Well, in fact, in fact, this is for zero driving. So these are still the bands of my trivial insulator, okay? And now I follow the time-dependent, um, sorry, sorry. I follow the time-dependent Schrodinger equation by uh, driving uh, the amplitude up and then just I keep uh, oscillating with those phases and look at what happens to the flow K modes. Oh, where, where is it? Here. Okay. You see, the bands start shrinking a little bit. These are flow K quasi energies, okay? Calculated for every period, obviously. They shrink because of the J0. Okay. Now you see that something curious happens, which is edge states emerge. Right? These are edge states of Floquet bands. Right? So as you see, you might say, okay, well, that's exactly what I would expect if I do the mapping and I think in terms of Haldane model. Almost, almost. If you look at the occupation of those Floquet states, you see the dots that denote how much electrons I have in the state. Uh, the right edge state is fully occupied, the other is empty. Uh, in equilibrium, I would expect, uh, say, feeling uh, these states and these states. Okay? So somehow I have a wrong occupation for the edge states, which is created by this non equilibrium thing. I'm crossing a transition, and as you know, Kibble Zurek mechanism, all kind of things, gaps close. You do not hope to be fully adiabatic. Huh? You create um, excitations in your system. Here, obviously, the excitations uh, live at the edge because these are the states that somehow are low quasi-energies in, in this uh, setting. And therefore, yeah, this is the thing. You can actually do it and verify that the, the picture that I was uh, alluding at is, in fact, correct in terms of Floquet quasi-energies with the care about uh, uh, occupation being a little bit non-equilibrium ones, okay? And not just the standard one that you would expect if you had an Aldane model, uh, I mean, equilibrium physics, okay? Unfortunately not, because they have a, they have a cut, I mean, the eggs in the things, and uh, they have confining. 
they realize, but that doesn't mean that they look at the edge states. They, they, they see things, if I remember well, they see, uh, they see currents flowing. Uh, I forgot exactly what they, they, I think that they see a transverse current, but they don't look specifically for the presence of, people who do things with uh, uh, photons in waveguides, they actually follow the uh, photons as they go through the edges of the thing. So they actually look at things. They don't look for the atom. Where is the atom one, atom two, or the other. But uh, in principle, there are edge states. Notice they typically have confining potential as well. And therefore, uh, I mean, this is in principle something oh, which. We, oh, this is 2016. Uh, where, is, where is it? Uh, this one, uh, 2016, yeah, okay. yeah, no, 14, okay, 2014. But since then, there is a lot of things, I mean, the first slide I show you, lots of things on uh, um, realizing for flow catcher and insulators, uh, effect of uh, several effects, uh, time crystals, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, activity. Uh, this non-equilibrium aspects uh, uh, should be taken in mind. So, uh, I mean, if I have to, somehow concludes this discussion and leave you with a final uh, transparency, maybe. Because you could dream of uh, actually creating higher churn numbers. If I don't stop here at omega larger than omega and I go down, in principle, I could realize uh, churn numbers equal to minus 3, 4, plus 2, the R of K that enters there can become a pretty complex, uh, I mean, with higher churn number uh, surface, but no, I don't want to show anything. I just, uh, no, sorry. I just want to uh, leave you with the message that when you do, um, when you do a shake two-dimensional system, you have to shake it right. So not too fast, in order to avoid heating and invoking higher bands, not too slow in order to avoid uh, resonances uh, in the system. I mean, if the frequency is somehow matches states that are in your bands, you start messing up your system rather than uh, driving it uh, um, topological, okay? Uh, and well, th there was a part on Tauless quantum pump, also there, uh, you can address the Floquet physics close to the adiabatic limit, and you discover that it is decorated by resonances. So once again, care when you approach the adiabatic limit. And I mentioned already in the um, uh, lecture yesterday that there are somehow uh, suggestions of saying that you can use this Fourier Floquet type of index to, in fact, create an artificially larger dimensionality for your system. For instance, these people, including Harper, presented uh, uh, test cases on single spin one half, which are driven by two incommensurate uh, laser, okay? In that case, the, pic the Fourier, Vanier, Stark, whatever picture invokes a two-dimensional lattice of frequencies, which means that somehow with a single spin one half, you can, in principle, <coughs> create two-dimensional tight binding uh, problems. And, uh, well, they, 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 they say that <coughs> the, the various drive harmonics effectively raise the dimensionality of the system and allow it to exhibit new phenomena. Uh, the role of this extra emergent dimension remains little utilized and even worse, little understood. So this is an exercise for you to understand it. <laughs> okay, I think I would stop here. Thank you. Uh.